On the other side, you've got Georgetown law professor Paul Butler, who had this response to a caller in NPR who descended from Confederate veterans. I think we need to focus on gun control and not be sidetracked by this. But I'm not somebody who thinks the battle flag should stay there, but I certainly honor my ancestors. I have no respect for your ancestors. Uh, as far as your ancestors are concerned, I, I shouldn't be a law professor at Georgetown. I should be a slave. Uh, that's why they fought that war. Uh, I don't understand what it means to be proud of a legacy uh, of, of terrorism and violence. Uh, last week at this time, I was in Israel. The idea that uh, a, a, a German would say, um, you know, that thing we did called the Holocaust, that was wrong, but I respect the courage of my Nazi ancestors, that wouldn't happen. The reason people can say what you said in the United States is, is because, again, black life just doesn't matter to a lot of people. Joining me now is Paul Butler, Georgetown professor of law at Georgetown University. And Paul, I was really uh, struck by the kind of frank honesty of that response, but it, but it gets to the heart of the matter. Do you think we are now having the conversation we should be, or, or is the sort of move against the flag happening with such rapidity that it's actually papering over the actual substance of the issue? It's a necessary conversation, Chris, but it's kind of surreal that it's necessary. I really was expected to provide a list of reasons about why I don't respect people who thought my ancestors were property. That's bizarre, just like it's bizarre that there has to be a special convening of the legislature in South Carolina to debate whether to take down a racist flag. The fact that we have to have that debate, again, is evidence that, that black lives just don't matter that much. You know, some people agree with me in the merits, but they said it was rude uh, to say that I don't respect that uh, woman's ancestors. So let me get this right. Uh, a white person says to a black person, I, I honor the people who wanted your ancestors to be slaves. That's fine. Uh, a black person says, I don't honor those people. That's rude. Again, that's white privilege all over again. And, and it goes to a larger issue that when black people talk to white people about white supremacy, we're supposed to be loving and forgiving. Hmm. The problem is love and forgiveness are not productive in American politics. That's not how social change is achieved. You know, you could do it through organized, organizing, you could do it through electoral politics, you could take it to the streets. But being nice in the face of white supremacy does not advance racial justice. Are, it sounds like, have you been getting a lot of blowback from this particular moment? Because I saw uh, it, it really did bl blow up, but I think because of the sort of frank honesty of it. Have you been, have you been uh, targeted for it? Uh, a, a tremendous amount of support. And again, a, a lot of people who thought that I wasn't respectful enough to this white woman who really was an ally. She gets it, and a part you didn't play, she said that she thought that the flag should come down. And, and Chris, that made me think of all these people who are doing the right thing, well-intentioned white folks in Charleston who are marching with the protesters to, to take down the flag. But get this, the terrorists chose Charleston because it used to be the center of African-American life in South Carolina. In 1980, the city was 50 percent black. Today, it's two-thirds white. Black people got pushed out of the city. They got pushed out of opportunity. So I think a lot of the good white people who think that the flag should come down don't understand their relationship mm. with white supremacy. They don't get how they benefit from gentrification, from denying opportunities to black people. There are so many taboos and niceties around all of this, um, and it has struck me the emphasis on civility. I think there's, there's some real value in, in maybe uh, being less concerned about civility. And, and Chris, where I really learned that was in Israel, because we all know they've got lots of problems. Uh, I went to dinner with a Palestinian law professor and, and an Orthodox Jewish law professor, hmm. And they went at it. You know, <laughs> their discord was out in the open. They didn't try to, yeah, they didn't try to make nice like we do in the United States. And, and again, I think in order to have that conversation, it's going to be raw. Feelings are going to get hurt. But look, African Americans, more than our feelings, have been getting hurt for 400 years. So this is the time.
All right, Paul Bleckler, thank you. It's always great to have you on. Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World, and I wanted to stop for a second to give a quick shout out to Professor Paul Butler uh, at Georgetown University, who <clears throat> uh, might be uh, the man who has the biggest testicles in America at the current moment. Uh, he went on to NPR and really said some stuff that I just thought was absolutely um, on point and very powerful. And he made his point and he defended it. Uh, basically, uh, you may have seen in the clip uh, before I started speaking that um, a white woman uh, basically said, um, you know, I, I want to get rid of the Confederate flag, but I want to show respect to my ancestors. And Butler said, I have no respect for your ancestors because... Uh, and he effectively argued that because uh, he had no respect because uh, her, her ancestors wanted to put his ancestors in chains. And uh, that, you know, and I couldn't disagree with that. Um, I think he's absolutely correct. Uh, there is nothing about the Confederate flag that is uh, very easy to defend uh, because uh, slavery and, and the treatment of people of color is not something that we can ever justify or feel comfortable with. Uh, what I really like about what Butler said is that uh, he gave kind of like kind of that raw, honest uh, truth that we need uh, when it comes to this conversation about racial equality. Um, we're not going to achieve equality by begging for it or by waiting for it or by hoping for it or by praying for it. We're going to achieve equality by engaging in these hard conversations, pushing people to the limit, uh, doing things without permission, like the young lady who climbed up the flagpole and took down the Confederate flag. I love it. Congratulations to her, too. Um, and so uh, I'm going to say this about Butler. Um, I've known about Butler for a while, uh, maybe almost 15 years or so. I remember seeing him on 60 Minutes once where he made a really good argument about the um, uh, basically arguing that uh, black people should nullify juries when it comes to nonviolent drug offenders. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that's what he was arguing, that basically um, because these laws are so draconian, they're so un unfair, unconstitutional and so racist we should just not convict a nonviolent drug offender. And, um, you know, I can't disagree with it. I mean, sure, we know selling drugs is bad, but uh, actually the most dangerous drug in the world is actually alcohol, not uh, not crack, not heroin, none of that. Um, and the difference is that alcohol is legal, so we think it's okay. But there was a time where alcohol was illegal, so you technically were a bad person if you sold alcohol, right? So it doesn't mean that drug dealers are good people or that we want them all around our communities. But at the same time, it does mean that the punishment has to fit the crime. So if you want to uh, punish someone, teach them a lesson, rehabilitate them, you give them a couple years in prison, maybe, maybe two, or th maybe three or four years. For some people, a month in prison is enough to change them for life. You don't put them in prison for 150 years. You don't do that. That's crazy. Um, in fact, I just went to recently to visit a brother who uh, got 15 life sentences on a first time nonviolent offense because he sold dope and he sold a lot of cocaine. And, uh, and, and it was interesting because his Colombian connects have already gone home. They've already gotten out of prison. So the people that were bringing billions of dollars worth of cocaine into the country, they're free. But the guy who sold a few million dollars worth of cocaine back in the 1980s is still in prison now. And what people have to understand is that when we're locking everybody up, you're destroying America because you're destroying families. And so you're destroying black America first, but eventually that spreads into the rest of America. A lot of the young people that you see who seem lost, who are really struggling, many of them are struggling because their parents were in and out of the criminal justice system. Uh, a lot of the things that we see as far as police, stop and frisk, racial profiling, all these other things going on in the, in the judicial system, police showing up looking like military commanders with, with all these Pentagon weapons. A lot of that came from the war on drugs, which which has been proven beyond any doubt to be an absolute complete failure. So uh, when I look back at what Butler said about nullifying juries um, or jury, jury null, excuse me, jury nullification, uh, you know, if, if at, at that time it seemed pretty radical, it seemed pretty extreme to a lot of people, but now we know that Butler was right. Um, and and so um, I just want to say congratulations to Butler, and I want to also encourage him. Uh, you know, when he deals with the backlash that comes from this to remain strong, I know he's already, he already knows this, but I'm saying it anyway. And I also want to say to you that if you get a chance to uh, look him up at Georgetown University, send him a quick little note of uh, thank you, of gratitude. Because believe me, when you do stuff like this, you're going to get a backlash, a huge backlash. He's getting it publicly and privately. Um, I believe that he can handle this. He's a strong black man. But uh, you never know. Uh, people need, need our support. We can't just sit back and watch the fight happen and not be willing to jump in and kick some ass if we have to. Um, the other thing that I like about Butler, and the reason I think he is the guy that, that's capable of handling this, 
this backlash is number one he has the spiritual fortitude to handle it uh, Butler is a guy who has full access to his humanity which is something that is not trained very well in the United States they don't want you to have full access to your humanity because if you fully if you think you're fully human then you feel like you deserve all the rights and privileges that come with uh, with being human and being American black people don't have that white supremacy teaches you from a very early age that you're only three-fifths of a human being, that you should have to work twice as hard to get half as much, that white people uh, deserve one life and you, de you deserve a different life, and that if you complain about this, then you're somehow a bad Negro. That's why a lot of y'all prof you know, professional types, the doctors, lawyers, professors, and people that have all these degrees and credentials and all this stuff, that's why you're scared to speak up when your boss insults you or when you know you have racism on the job. You're scared to speak up because you were trained to be quiet and docile. It's not your fault. It's something that has been with us for 400 years. I mean, back on the plantation, if they saw a black man buck up and actually think that he was a man and stand up to the mass of man to man, do you know what they did to that man? Do you know what horrible things they would do to him in front of his family? They might rape him in front of his family. They might fill his body up with gunpowder and blow it up in front of his family because they want to send a very clear message to his sons. Look, if you get bold like your daddy, if you expect to be treated equally like your daddy, the same thing is going to happen to you. So as a result, hundreds of years later, America is a country that does not, um, that, that keeps black men as little boys. Many of us are still little boys. That's why you see rappers running around with pants sagging and getting locked up and over silly stuff because a lot of them still think they're little boys because they don't feel like they have the right to a full access to true manhood. Uh, manhood means defending your family. It means defending your community. It means speaking up uh, for what is right. It goes back to uh, what Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr. was an impressive guy. But if you really want to be impressed, look up Martin Luther King Sr. Look up the seed from which he came. And you'll hear little stories about, uh, for example, when Martin was about 11 or 12 and a white police officer pulled his father over and said, boy, what are you doing out here this late? And Martin Sr., you know what he did? He pointed at his son and he said, that there's a little boy. I'm a man. And until you address me as such, I'm not going to answer any more of your questions. And when Martin saw that strength in his father, that gave him strength to be a man. That led him to believe that, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be a punk. I'm not supposed to bow out whenever there's responsibility. I'm not supposed to run away whenever there's danger. I'm supposed to stand strong and protect my integrity and protect my people at all costs. That's manhood. Paul Butler's a man. And for that, I congratulate him. And, I, and that's one of the reasons why I feel that he does have the ability to withstand this criticism because I think he knows who he truly is. Second thing about Butler that's really interesting to me is, uh, and, and lets me know that he's ready to withstand this, is that the man is a lawyer, and he's a damn good lawyer. You don't get a chance to be uh, a law professor at Georgetown by being stupid. Um, he's able to put together arguments that are clear, that make his point very firmly. Um, and, uh, and I have so much respect for that because I've seen that. I've seen celebrities that have made, and I'm talking about a celebrity, one celebrity in particular that said something that I thought was great. I loved what he said, but when uh, his feet were put to the fire, when he was forced to defend his point, he didn't make any sense. And I felt bad for him. I really did. I said, wow, I really wish I could be on this show with him right now as his lawyer. <laughs> and, and I'm not a lawyer, but but I w he needed some defense right right at that moment. I was, I was thinking, man, I wish I could be there to help him explain what he's feeling. Because sometimes racism confuses us. It makes us feel a certain way, and we, 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 we respond. And we, and we don't even know exactly where all these emotions are coming from. We don't know. We feel trapped, but we don't know why we're trapped. You know, or so somebody will come along and say, well, yeah, well, you know, black people are getting killed in the hood, but, but black people are the ones pulling those triggers. Black people are killing each other. It's not the white man's fault. The white man isn't doing it. And it looks that way, right? Uh, and, and that's because if you don't study, if you don't understand the sociological and political and the economic uh, dimensions of this problem and how it fits into history, then it's very easy to be deceived by what you see. And so you respond to it and you're mad about it, but you don't exactly know how to um, communicate how you're feeling, uh, communicate that rage. So this is one of the reasons why I want to uh, encourage people, make sure your sons and your daughters get um, get the best of education so that they can verbalize and explain how they're feeling so that when they see oppression they can understand it and then communicate that uh, you know, in a way that actually makes sense so they're not just walking around angry and don't know why uh, but also remember this last point I'll make about education this is what I like about Paul Butler because 
I don't give a damn if a brother is tenured at Georgetown or or as a professor or a lawyer or a doctor. That that doesn't impress me. We got a whole bunch of miseducated black people out here that whose brains they went to school a long time, but their brains are filled with the wrong stuff. They think they got an education when really they got an indoctrination. They can be as much committed to a white supremacist system as a white supremacist already is. So being an educated Negro does not impress me. I know, I've known thousands of them. I have a PhD myself, so I've been around all the little academic snobs who think they're better than other people and all that stuff. Um, and, and I've only seen a few diamonds in, 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 in tons of sand. Uh, what, what impressed me about Butler is that he understands the system, but he's not of the system. He does not let the system define him. Uh, he's working in that system. He's at Georgetown. He's got his job there. God bless him for that. Um, and believe me, it's difficult because when I was at Syracuse, I got all kinds of hell when I was saying stuff like that on CNN and all this stuff. Um, which, But I'm happy being outside of that. But the fact that he's inside makes me um, even happier. Um, but, um, you know, the other thing about it is that he understands the difference. And, and, I, and this is the difference I want you to communicate with your kids and make sure they understand this. There's a difference between going to school and being educated. There's a difference between being educated and having knowledge. There's a difference between having knowledge and having critical thinking skill, right? So somebody could go to school. Uh, George Bush went to Harvard and Yale. So going to Harvard and Yale obviously does not make you um, a knowledgeable, educated person. Uh, it just means you went to Harvard and Yale. <clears throat> um, getting education uh, is, is kind of a tricky process because you're being educated by your oppressor. So your oppressor is going to teach you what they want you to know. Propaganda is very, very real. And the indoctrination into white supremacy starts as a child. You learn very early that most of the good things are being, you know, most of the great things that have been done in history have been done by white people. Uh, you learn that most of the positions of power are held by white people. You know, so if you want to be successful, you have to act like white people. Uh, you know that most of the wealth in America is held by white people. So if you want to be economically successful, you have to act like white people. You have to get in with white people. You have to get white people to like you. You have to remain silent when white people mistreat you. You can't speak up honestly about the history of discrimination, racial oppression, because white people get mad at you. And white people get mad at you, you're destroying your career. And destroying your career is stupid. That's what you're brainwashed into believing. So education... Um, can be an indoctrination, which therefore can uh, cause you to deviate from who you were truly meant to be. So that's where knowledge comes in, right? And knowledge is a beautiful thing right now because you can get all the knowledge you want on the Internet. You can educate your children on black history on the Internet. Uh, everything you ever want to know from any university in the history of the world is right there on the Internet. There's nothing, there's almost nothing you can't solve with a good Google search, going to Wikipedia, going to YouTube, all these resources, free online classes, all of that. You really don't have to pay to go to college anymore except for the certification that allows you to, uh, to integrate into the white economic system that's out here that needs these sort of academic certifications to verify that you've actually learned the skill that you claim to know or whatever the case may be. But if you're looking for knowledge, um, I get most of my knowledge outside of a university. Um, in fact, universities and, and, and public schools can be as dangerous as they are helpful if you don't know how to use them in the right way. But then the last point, and I'm done after I say this, is that last piece, critical thinking skills. You can be the most knowledgeable person in the world, have the most education, go to school for a million years, but if you don't know how to think for yourself, someone will occupy your brain. They will take over your thinking. If you don't know who you are uh, and aren't strong enough to think critically about everything, Someone will come along and they will kidnap your psyche. They will get you to get go along with their agenda instead of your agenda. They will tell you who you are before you really know who you are. So um, <clears throat> I just think about people I know who went to school uh, at top universities who um, just are so lost it's, it's, it's not even funny. And, um, and, and part of that loss comes from not having critical thinking skills and or not having the courage and the sense of self necessary to engage in assertive critical thinking and to not be afraid to act on it and to speak on it, right? And I'm not just talking about white folks and white supremacy. I'm talking about sometimes in black leadership. Uh, so you can argue, again, some people can say this, that the biggest mistake Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali ever made was that they were in incredibly and undeniably and unquestionably loyal to another man's thinking. Uh, I'm not going to diss one way or the other, but I am going to say that if you were to ask those two guys if they regret that decision, they would probably say yes. In fact, Malcolm writes about that all the time. Uh, or, he, sorry, he did write about that. He, he doesn't, you know, Malcolm passed, but you get the point. Uh, so the idea here is... Um, at the end of the day, when you put
pull all this information together and you you know how white folks treat you you know what uh you know not every white person is a racist right or or is in support of racism at least not consciously but we also know uh that rate white supremacy is very very real uh we also know that there are consequences for speaking up on it but we also know there's a necessity to uh pave the way for the next generation to live a better life than the ones that we live the, the lives that we've lived so far so uh at the end of the day that critical thinking piece is so important Never let anybody, anybody occupy your mind. In fact, you may even want to question the whole idea of black leadership. Um, I'm, not, I'm not here to be your leader. I'm here to be an advisor. You're the king. You're the queen. You're the one who makes the final decision in terms of how you feel. I'm just here to share information um, in a way that might help you see something that you were meant to see from the beginning. So um, never let anybody steal your critical thinking skill. And then never let anybody kill your uh, desire and ability to act. You know, once you figure out what's going on and how it's all working and what's wrong with the system, um, you know, don't let this this nonsense scare you, because uh, I think you you always regret uh, not following your heart and not speaking up uh, based on what's in your mind. So, uh, long story short, Paul Butler, big ups, brother. Uh, maybe one day you and I will get a chance to talk. I have so much respect for what you did. I think it was awesome. Um, and uh, I'm going to support you everywhere I can. Well, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World. I'm about to get out of here, by the way. My Black Wealth Boot Camp starts uh, in mid-July, and uh, you can find out more. Uh, it's a five-day uh, lecture series where we talk about the fundamentals of building black wealth, starting businesses, building your own empire, basically having your own shit. Uh, and, and I think it's important for black people to have their own shit. Excuse my French. Maybe it's bad for me to cuss, but I don't care. Um, uh, but but that's the point. So I'm going to take all the stuff I've learned from teaching finance all these years and and uh, teach a lot of that to you. It's not a free class, but it's not. It doesn't cost as much as it, it costs when I was teaching at Syracuse. So uh, so it'll be much cheaper than that. So I hope you'll find you'll um, you'll join the class and you can find out more. Uh, the URL should be up uh, by July 1st ish, I guess. Uh, it's theblackwealthbootcamp.com, or you can also find out more right now. Put your name on the list at boycewatkins.com. You can get more information that way. So until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. I am gone. Peace.